Hello and happy International Women's Day and happy Women's Month too. A month to celebrate women is definitely not enough. We should celebrate each other every day for showing up, for stepping forward against all the structures designed to hold us back. Welcome to this training webinar organized by Witness in partnership with Stand to End Rape Initiative. This training is on combating media narratives that fuel sexual and gender-based violence and impede access to justice. You would agree with me that media narratives that promote gender stereotypes and disinformation greatly hinders the capacity of survivors of sexual and gender-based violence to get justice. Stand and Brave Initiative and Witness in 2022 issued a media reporting guide to support the effective coverage by the media of sexual and gender-based violence in Nigeria. And we immediately recognized on after working on sexual and gender-based violence for many years and misinformation and disinformation, we realized that the coverage of SGBV across the world in Nigeria was the focus of this guide significantly has risen over the years. However, an ethical reporting that harms survivors of SGBV even more is widespread. The rise in sensationalized headlines and visuals, language that blames the victim and terms like sex scandal, they do distort the crime of rape and foster a culture of shame and silence. And in addition, online abuse against women is a direct attack on women's visibility and full participation in public life. So the media, including social media, has demonstrated great potential to mobilize support against sexual and gender-based violence. However, Viable disinformation in CDRs limits the collective impact of civil society actors and well-meaning individuals in eliminating SGBV and have significantly contributed to the injustice experienced by survivors. So this training today will offer helpful guidelines through case study analysis to ensure that journalists and other stakeholders in the media ecosystem prioritize ethical considerations that center on survivors in their reporting. My name is Inkem Agonga, and I lead the Africa program at Witness, and I am, I am joined by Elfrida Tolulokwe Adeleye, the communications officer at Stand to End Rape Initiative. And together, we would provide guidelines that would help ensure media practitioners and other stakeholders through their platforms, do not perpetrate disinformation that protects the perpetrators and silence the voice, the voices of survivors. And so we would run this training for an hour, 30 minutes, and we would go over a, a number of key tactics that could be deployed by media practitioners. We would also open up at the end of our presentations for questions, if there are any. And if you're watching this video later, please leave a comment and we're monitoring that as well. And we would get back to you with whatever questions that you might have. And so I'm going to kick off with gender disinformation and online image-based violence. What is rape culture? Rape culture is where rape and sexual violence is an accepted and expected norm. It supports violence against women, make rape seem okay. It tells us it is our fault and tells the perpetrator it is their nature. So the strategy of gender disinformation seeks to remove women from a position of power. And it's important that we understand this, that when we speak about gender disinformation, 
it is a form of violence against women. And in its very nature, its objective is to remove women from the position of power. But before we go into gender disinformation, let us talk about misinformation and disinformation, which is where gender disinformation stems from. And for those who may not be aware, what is misinformation? Misinformation is false, inaccurate, or misleading information regardless of the intention to deceive. And while disinformation is the deliberate creation, distribution, and amplification of false, inaccurate, or misleading information with the primary intent to deceive. We could also include that it is a coordinated spread of inaccurate information and at scale, specifically targeting groups of individuals who are vulnerable to that form of information in order to influence their decision and action. So in the reportage of SGBV cases, the stories of survivors are often scrutinized for loopholes and used as a segue to spread misinformation and disinformation. And this gives disinformation merchants and misinformation agents the impetus and conducive environment to propagate disinformation, mostly using four approaches to achieve their objective. And this is to dismiss, distort, distract, and dismay. So what does this mean? To dismiss the accounts of survivors of, of, of SGBV, also to distort their story and to distort the crime of rape or the crime associated with sexual and gender-based violence. It's also to distract, to pivot. And so you would see stories like, rather than facing the substantive, the substantive issue at hand, the focus is on the character of the survivor. It's on the pedigree of the survivor. These are irrelevant factors that do not in any way take away from the violence that the survivor has experienced. However, it is a deliberate attempt to distract from the perpetrator and also to dismay. So one of the, the most prominent disinformation tactic is to make survivors believe that there is no way they can get justice. As survivors of sexual and gender-based violence, justice is elusive. And so they do not even attempt to speak up. And so they are dismayed. So these are the three tactics that, that is deployed by, um, by perpetrators as well as their accomplices to silence the voices of survivors of sexual and gender-based violence. So what is gender disinformation? And why has this aspect of disinformation not gained as, as, as much attention as it should. This is not surprise, surprising because while gender disinformation could impact on anyone on the basis of their gender, we research has shown that gender disinformation disproportionately impacts women and sexual minorities. And historically, women and sexual minorities do not get the needed attention. They are often dismissed, ignored, or disregarded. And so gender disinformation is the spread of deceptive and inaccurate information and images or media against anyone on the basis of their gender. Like I said, while gender disinformation could target anyone, women and gender diverse people are disproportionately impacted. And this includes women who are human rights defenders, activists, political leaders, and female public figures it is, a, it is done in a way that draws on misogyny and societal stereotypes. And they often frame women as untrustworthy, unintelligent, emotional, angry, crazy, or sexual. And so you'd see that the media plays a huge role in heightening this, this, these gender stereotypes that essentially gives wings to gender disinformation to thrive. And as Alan Ginseng, 
aptly puts it, whoever controls the media, the images controls the culture. And that's why it is important for us to concentrate on the, the media as a block because their, their platform is so influential as it in many ways impacts on the access of justice to survivors of gendered, uh, of sexual and gender-based violence. So mainstream media has the power to shape conversations about issues in our communities. News stories about sexual violence affect the way we think about it. So it's really not about, it, it goes away from just the, 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 the violence or the abuse. And it then deals with the perception of it. This is what leads to rape apologists, leads to victim blaming, and also holds perpetrators to a lower standard. So they can also impose a hierarchy that frames certain kinds of sexual violence or certain kinds of survivors as less legitimate than others. And this is very true when there is a categorization of, of um, who is more equal than others. And so you see situations where the, the, the survivor of the violence might be someone who is mentally impaired or somebody who is a, a person living, um, a person with disability or a, a, a female sex worker. These, this, the, the, their situation, the violence against them may not be taken as seriously as, uh, as a non-disabled counterpart, for example, or of a married woman, or of a, a, of a classified group that society has bestowed a privilege on. So this is what media narratives can do. It can really help to elevate and perpetrate hierarchies that frame certain kinds of sexual violence as, as lower than others. And so it is important for media practitioners to understand the power they wield and how they can use their platforms to better protect survivors of sexual and gender-based violence. And so why are we speaking about this? And why is it important? What are the factors that make gender disinformation elusive? So we're speaking about this because gender disinformation plays on existing societal stereotypes, which are often acceptable by the larger population of the society. And so it is often elusive. It is often not recognized for what it is, right? And, and so people, and that's why it doesn't have the, the attention that it deserves because people can't readily identify it. And when you're not able to diagnose a problem, you really will not be able to prefer solutions. And so what are the factors that makes this elusive? It's because it plays on jokes and code language. And these this, this terms may seem innocuous or meaningless without context, right? And so there, there are rape jokes, for example, they're, they're jokes that speak about um, uh, how you can um, do whatever it is you like, even when it's in a violent nature, to a person with disability, because there are some stereotypes associated with this group of people. And, and they, another thing is that they may not necessarily appear as outrightly false. And so, it then becomes difficult to, 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 to counter it. So when, when, a, when, a, when a piece, when a statement is false, then you can fact check it. Then fact checking works. But in the case of gendered disinformation, it may not necessarily be outrightly false, but taken out of context. And so that makes it difficult to identify. Another is it may appear, it may not necessarily appear to denigrate a certain gender, but still reinforces harmful stereotypes. So an example is when there is a statement that says, oh, women are nurturing. Women are naturally nurturing. And when you experience um, uh, or receive this statement in the, in the facial value of it, it doesn't necessarily seem 
to denigrate women. However, we know that that stance of women being nurturing is what has led to women being perceived as weaker, women being perceived as not suitable for leadership in the professional space or in the political space, as women who are mothers are not at term irresponsible if they choose to own and run a business. Right. So you see how gender disinformation plays out. And then the weaponization of religion. We see how religion is used as a tool to perpetrate gender disinformation. And so when, when you hear of comments as um, women are expected to be submissive within the religious context, what does that really mean? How does it translate? into the exclusion of women from spaces of power and leadership? How is that used to then um, portray women who are in the public space as, as arrogant or as, um, as um, um, women of easy virtue? These are the concussions that we that women who are in the public space have to endure because the perpetrators use hide behind the toga of religion to cast a passion on their character. We also see how coordinated disinformation campaign appear to be organic or are a mix with organic activities. So there is um, an army of of, of trolls, of individuals online who seem to be a part of the community, who seem to be um, well-meaning individuals who are using social media to air their views, but they are in fact coordinated and perhaps under the, the payroll of whoever has, has commissioned them to go against the woman who is challenging the status quo or seeking to have a voice or critical of, of um, patriarchal structures. And then what is the larger impact of gender disinformation? It could also threaten individual safety. It could delegitimize the voices of women human rights defenders, lead to self-censorship. And this is something that we see a lot because the impact of gender disinformation is not just on the individual who, the, who is the target, it also extends to other women who see what, has, what could happen to them if they dared to have a voice, if they dared to take a stand. And so it is really victimizing women in the position of leadership, women who are in the spotlight, so that that serves as deterrent to other aspiring women who want to own their voices, who want to use their agency. So that then leads to self-censorship and women begin to take more conservative stands or just really try to blend in so that they are not singled out or um, for attacks. And that could lead to apathy. And by apathy, it would apathy towards political participation, apathy even towards social media visibility or online visibility in general. And this could also propagate violence against women and girls in real life scenarios and could contribute to repressive, the formulation of repressive laws and policies. So you see how gender disinformation could translate into other fairs of society. It could further lead to the discrimination against women and girls in political and economic spheres, negatively impact anti-SGBV advocacy efforts where it is not just the victims, it's not just the, 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 the victims and survivors of sexual and gender-based violence that are being attacked, but also the human rights defenders and advocates who are speaking up for them and pushing for anti-SDBV advocacy efforts. It leads to a decline in the progression towards substantive equality, which is what we're fighting for and could result to the reinforcement of harmful beliefs, practices, and stereotypes 
which could undermine democratic electoral processes and hinders room for equal representation of women in governance. So we went from the, the impact on the individual to how this could impact the entire society. Moving on, let us now become a bit practical and let us look at the headlines now and how these in practice, how headlines in practice could actually impact on, 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 on the voices of, impact on silencing the voices of sexual and gender-based violence or distorting the crime, these this forms of crimes against um, women and others. So there is this headline now, ex-school nurse admits to having sex with a student offering him $2,000 in hush money. Arrested Abuja prostitutes narrate how they were raped by policemen who wore pure water sachets as condom. Teenage pregnancy has been on the rise for years with 17,337 underage women conceiving in 2017, 19, uh, and then 19,832 in 2018, 23,544 in 2019, and 19,701 in 2020, and on and on. It's teenage pregnancy screaming lack of access to, con to contraception. So I'll just give you 30 minutes to think through what could be done differently in these headlines and in the stories. I'm sure you have some ideas already. But when you look at the first headline that says, man defiles 11 year old girl. The use of the word defile already creates a perception that this girl who is a survivor of this male perpetrator has, has been condemned by the violence that was meted against her. But that's not the case. Survivors of SGBV are not, are not the crime or the violence against them. They are beyond that. And so describing, using the word defile, suggests that the, the, this, this child is completely condemned. And so they, they describe the crime, this, describe the violence being done without attributing it to the survivor. The attribution should be on the perpetrator. This headline could perpetrate um, a shaming culture on the survivor. And when you say ex-school nurse admits to having sex with a student, offering $2K in hush money, it would be good to give a little bit of context to this. We know that anyone under six, under 18, there are different jurisdictions around the world, and even in Nigeria, the, 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 the age of consent differs from one region of the country to the other. But we know we have the Child Rights Act, which says, which states that anyone under 18 should be considered a minor. And so a minor is not, does not have the capacity to give consent. And that means that a, a minor cannot have sex with an adult. So the use of the word sex suggests that there was consent given. And there are other words that could be used to better describe the situation. Arrests, Abu, arrested Abuja prostitutes narrate how they were raped. And so when you use the word prostitutes in a society that is that that is really shrouded around morality what you have done is you have reduced the likelihood that there would be there would be concern towards the survivors here 
of sexual and gender-based violence. So there are other ways in which these stories could have been written. And then when you say teenage pregnancy has been on the rise for years, and you use the word women, I do not, I, when you say underaged women, that it, it feels like there is a conflict there. Could you be an underage woman? And could there be other ways in which you could describe these teenage girls who are mothers now? And could you have provided better context to that? So these are practical examples that could help us reflect to say, how could we better write stories or use pictures? In this case, we have pictures of girls who are, who are uh, who's, the picture is taken from behind with babies strapped behind them. What is that picture expected to convey? Could this have been better illustrated with a graph, with, a, with a, an infographic, without necessarily having their pictures on display the way it has been done? So these are the, the, this already creates a perception of 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 these girls who whom you're trying to um, bring some form of attention to. So there is a need to be thoughtful and informed on how our stories, either using picture or video, could distort the the perception of sexual and gender based violence. And so how does media contribute to gendered disinformation? Although several survivors have come out to share their stories, it has become a practice for the media to mostly focus on cases involving high profile individuals and celebrities. And what does this do? This creates the impression that the, 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 the stories that are worth paying attention to are only the ones that are done against high profile individuals. And so, and this is not, this is not, this is not reflective of what the evidence show. In Nigeria alone, there are a total of 9,680 complaints of sexual violence and over a hundred thousand complaints of domestic violence over 11,000 complaints of rape, which brings the total to a total of 126,000. How reflective are we of these figures in our reporting? And also we see how religious orthodoxy and cultural bias are amongst the two pillars of which rape culture continues to thrive. And so how does the media play up these biases? Another thing that we need to pay attention to is the media de depiction of what the crime of rape is and the conventional profile of a rapist. And so this is, this is reinforced by, by skits, by skits makers. We'll also see that the stories that bloggers choose to, to highlight where the, 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 the profile of who a rapist is, is often maybe someone who is um, mentally impaired or um, somebody who has an addiction to drugs or, or, or a person who um, belongs to a, a particular group, maybe um, from what you would describe uh, 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 an informal settlement, some form of, um, 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 you know, a, someone who belongs to the, the lower cater of the society. And that is the, that is the profile that people have about who a rapist is. And this, the media contributed to shaping this profile. And then what happens is that when uh, uh, what society would describe as a respectable per personality, a, respect a respectable individual in the society is accused of rape, or accused of any form of sexual and gender-based violence, immediately there is a feeling of disbelief and say, no, he or she doesn't fit the profile of who a, rape, a rapist is. And the scrutiny then is pointed at the survivor. And then the burden of proof is, has to be shouldered by the, by the survivor against a public 
army who do not believe that a, a rapist could look a certain way. And so this is, this, is, this is very important, and journalists and media practitioners need to be mindful of this, including movie producers, actors, movie directors, skit makers. It is important that this is taken, they take this into due consideration. Another thing that is really important is um, conducting interviews with survivors of, gender and, of sexual and gender-based violence. It is an, important to get the perspective of the survivors so that they are able to tell their story. It is an empowering, an empowering way to, to, um, to the survivors. It gives them agency. And then it also, it also um, puts forward their perspective. But in conducting interviews with survivors, it is very delicate. And there's, there is a duty of care that we all must have, journalists, human rights defenders, et cetera, everyone. It's not just the responsibility of journalists. Even we as activists and human rights defenders as well, we have a duty of care to the survivors when we go in to interview them or and, and either, either um, a text interview, an audio interview, or a video interview. We must, we must do this sensitively. And, and, and what, are, what are the tips that could be useful? It is important that you plan. Planning is very important. And in planning, planning aids, planning and preparation. These are very important aspects to conduct an, an interview. And what does planning entail? Where, is, where will the interview happen? How will the survivor get there? Within the place where the interview is happening, how do we en ensure their safety, ensure their privacy? All of this needs to be taken into consideration. Also, consent and key safety measures. We must get consent from the survivors. And you, like I had mentioned earlier, anyone under 18 is incapable of giving informed consent. And so if you're dealing with a minor, please have a caretaker who is an adult that could give consent on their behalf. And what does that mean? It, is, it doesn't just mean that they would sign the document, but they would also be present in the room when the interview is happening to the level, to the extent possible, to the level of the safety of the survival, right? And when we say consent, we actually mean informed consent. So they are completely aware of what the interview is about, what, what you would do with their response. In entirety, would it be put in a report? Would it be, would, would it be used in a documentary, in a radio program? Will it be shared publicly? What format would it be distributed? You have to fully disclose this to the survivor and get their consent for that. And it's also important to know that consent can be withdrawn. Oh, yes. Whoever gives a consent can withdraw their consent. And the moment they withdraw their consent, it, there is a responsibility on you to respect that. And in the course of, and as things progressive, progresses, if anything changes in from the initial agreement, you have a responsibility to go back to the survivor and inform them and get their consent to proceed. And then scheduling. Scheduling is important. It is we, The survivors are at the center of this. So we must work with their schedule, walk around what works for them, ensure their privacy and follow up with them. It is important that we are not extractive. We do not just take the interview and we're done. No, that is an extractive practice. And as journalists, we cannot be perpetrating that. Continue to follow up and provide whatever support that you are to the extent possible. That duty of care must continue even after the interview is done. Another aspect of gender disinformation, as well as um, violence against women, is image-based violence. And this is often 
the use of images, videos, with the aid of technology to perpetrate harmful, um, harmful and misleading information against an individual on the basis of their gender. And so under this, we see the rise of um, what we all call deep fakes. And for those who do not know what deep fake is, deep fake is the use of artificial intelligence to make a person appear to say and do something that they never did. The, 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 the advancement in this technology is one that allows for a realistic simulation of an individual, um, an individual's likeness, which could include a physiological likeness, as well as the sound, the sound of their voice. And, and could portray them in a context, in, a, in an environment that they, they've never been to, or to say things or do things that they never did. This we have seen play out where journalists, sometimes political um, women politicians, have seen videos of themselves in non-consensual sexually explicit activity. And what this does is to shame these individuals and drive them away from public life. So the picture that we have up here is a picture of a journalist. Her name is Rana Ayab, and she was at the forefront against um, the, the rape culture in India. And she spoke very um, vehemently against it. And the response to this was a video of her in a sexually explicit activity. And she said that her first, at the moment she saw that video, she threw up. And it was a, it was a horrifying experience for her. And of course it is not true, but who is going to believe it to be not? And even if they do, it doesn't take away the embarrassment that it has cost her. But not just her, other journalists like her, other women and girls who see what has happened to her for speaking up against sexual and gender-based violence. It could force them to not speak up because they do not want that to happen to them as well. And so there are other, there are other, forms, there are other forms of technology that's also used to, um, to silence women, uh, one of which is the use of bots. And a bot is a computer algorithm that automatically produces content and interacts with humans on social media, trying to emulate and possibly alter their behavior. Without a high sense of digital literacy, it's becoming increasingly difficult to know which account is operated by a bot and which is done by a human, because the, 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 algorithm is the, the algorithm used in training these bots is becoming more sophisticated by the day. And of course, deep fakes, shallow fakes as well. Um, shallow fix is still the most widespread um, form of media, digital media manipulation. And this is because the technology used to create shallow fix is really very easy to use. It's just your regular Photoshop or just cropping of an image, superimposing it on something else. And, and this, is, this could be done by anyone who has little or no training on, on the use of, of, of technology. And, and, and we see this a lot with um, screenshots pur purported to be from a sex tape or um, superimposing, superimposing of the face of a known, a known figure and sometimes individuals who are not popular as well on, on a nude photo appearing to be of them. And so that level of, of invasion actually leaves women and girls feeling exposed. There's also the, the, the challenge of limited detection tools and detection capacity. The rise in technology used in manipulation does not correspond with a rise in detection tools. And even where the detection tools are available, there is a low capacity on how to use those tools. And this further increases the vulnerability of women and girls. 
it's also important that we begin to think about the low ethical standards within technology and how that has impacted in the way the irresponsible um, design and development of tools that further leave women and girls vulnerable. And this, this also goes with the low digital literacy rates that we experience worldwide, really. But in the global south, there is a significant um, um, low level of digital literacy rate as well. And so there's also a responsibility on the media to advocate for a higher ethical standard in, within the, the, the technological space. How do we begin to hold big tech accountable to the design and development of the tools that they, that, that they put out? How do we begin to ensure that safety is introduced by design and not as a response to, to the abuse of those tools? And the media can, can play a key role in this as well. And so what is the response? How can we respond to some of these challenges, either as the media, but also as individual active bystanders? One we need to do is to ensure that we move away from a reactive approach and become proactive and understand that it has to be intersectional. The media can't do this alone. There has to be an intersectional lens in approaching gender disinformation. How do we identify the risk factors proactively? How do we, as the media, in reporting disinformation, do not repeat it? So, so some of the tactics that I've seen that some media organizations have deployed in fact checking is to publish the false account and then put an X box on it. Now, what you have done is you have just republished a false information. Many of us might remember the famous quotes by the president of Nigeria, President Muhammadu Buhari, who said that his wife belongs to the other room. Many media organizations in their reports of that account, rather than report an, an, an analysis of that statement, they reported verbatim what the president said. And what did that do? That further reinforced the fact that the place of a woman is not within the workforce, is not within, is not at the decision table, but rather outside of those spaces. So it is important that the media does not repeat the disinformation. And then we must begin to build resilience. Build, and the, the media can play a key role in that and document the threats. What are the threats? How can we begin, how can the media begin to promote ways in which we can develop early warning signs and, and promote that and raise the alarm and tackle those responsible as well. Move the focus from the survivors and to the perpetrators because they are the ones that the spotlight should be on. Of course, this must be done ethically because by, by the grand norm on, in most countries, you are innocent until proven guilty, right? But then the responsibility should not be on the survivor because that then perpetuates a culture of silence and a culture of shame. So it must, in reporting sexual and gender-based violence, the protection of the survivor must be primary, must be at the center of it. And then understand context and value expertise, right? The media can, this, can report SGBV not as an episodic event, rather as a thematic focus. So we do not have to only encounter SGBV when there is an incident. It can be a core pillar within the media agenda that we would constantly and consistently speak about SGBV and the different aspects of it. And then these must continuously be iterative. One last thing on a final note, I would say that building resilience against gender disinformation requires a cross 
interdisciplinary approach rooted in the lived experiences of those most at risk. And what do I mean by cross-disciplinary approach? What do I mean by an intersectional lens? I mean that we all as stakeholders must work together. The media must work with civil society as well as the tech, the tech um, stakeholders there, policy makers. It is really intersectional and we all must work in, we, we must work in a coordinated fashion and break our individual silos and, we, and understand that in our spheres of influence, we need each other and we can help each other out. And so this is a call to the media as well. You could reach out to the civil society within, within your community you could reach out to the community gatekeepers, the religious gatekeepers, because we need their buy-in. How do we get them to be on board to ensure that when we report, when you put out a report on any issue that, that affects or bothers around sexual and gender-based violence, it is holistic, that all the elements are featured and all the voices necessary to present an authentic view of account is contained within that reportage, within that story, within that video. At this point, I would end my presentation and I would hand over to Tolu for her part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nken, for that wonderful presentation. Yes, so as we have learned, language is very important. It's the means which, which we're all here gathered and able to make sense of what we are saying. Even animals have their own means of, even, even animals have their own languages through which they communicate. As for human beings who are disabled and unable to speak, they have, they have also created their own language, their own form of communication. So language is the principal method of human communication. With language, you're able to share ideas, our thoughts and feelings with one another as we all gather here to examine the role the media plays in, 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 in destroying harmful narratives about sexual and gender-based violence, we are all communicating, sharing our ideas and sharing our thoughts. That We are able to do that through language. And also as important as language is, as, as vital as it is and as, as, as advantageous as it is, it could also be disastrous. If we do not use our language for good, it could also lead to the downfall of humanity, it can lead to the destruction of societies, and we all do not want that. And this is especially, this is especially true for the manner in which rape and other forms of sexual violence are communicated. So in this part of the world, we are a conservative society, we do know that, but there are certain ways in which we talk about things. It's really, last week, we had a review of, uh, of our consent education materials at the Santo Indip Initiative, and one of, one of the participants, not even one, quite a number of participants were like, oh, they don't like the language in which the manual was written. And it was really weird because, again, we are discussing sexual violence, and there's no way for us to use euphemisms and, oh, let's try to butter it up, people do not know this thing. It, it, it's, it perpetuates rape culture when we try to decode or limit the language which we speak about sexual violence. Then, sorry about that. So would then lead to rape culture. Rape culture is very, very bad. So it is, it is a lifeline of, 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 of of misogyny, it is very for for misogynists perpetuating rape culture, maintaining maintaining it is very important for them to hold their own leash. It is an environment that enables rape and other forms of sexual violence. Not only do we have rape, not only do we have rape being common in in, in rape culture, but we also see it as being normalized. So, if you are raped, for instance, in a society where rape culture is very is seen as a norm, it's not a it's not an out of the ordinary thing. Oh, you are raped. Oh, that's fine. And even if it's not explicit, oh, we have a no. No one will say oh, our society enables rape culture. No one will say oh yes, rape culture is, is celebrated here. But you can just see it. You can decode it through which rape to which victims are, are treated, which in the manner which they are spoken about, in which their cases are, 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 are dealt with. And you can just see it. Unfortunately for us in this part of the world, rape culture is very prevalent here. It's in only in a place. In, it's only in a country like us or in a society like us where rape culture is common. We see people telling um, telling victims and survivors to oh, keep your voices down. It's only here that you see survivors and 
victims being bullied. You see people being visibly afraid to speak out. That's because there's rape culture prevalent there. You don't have to call ourselves Federal Rape Republic of Nigeria or say, oh, yes, we celebrate rape here for us to act, for us to see the semblance of normalization of rape culture in our society. And as unfortunate as that is, it's, it's, it is the bedrock of, of gender based violence, um, of sexual violence, rather. And a major, a major enabler of rape culture, unfortunately, is the media. Everyone here, we're all products of socialization. Like we all learned of so socialization, a major means of socialization is the family and also the media. We all, even if you're not particular, even if you don't sit down and watch the news, you all, we, we, consume, we consume things that media produces. And mind you, media is not just news, it's not just television, it's the internet, it's the way we all get information every day. Almost everyone's on the, on the WhatsApp group, we get consent. Uh, although not related to sexual um, and gender-based violence, but recently during the election, we all had people. We had people coming out to 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 to, to fact check things that were being shared. But they had gone viral on social media. They had gone viral viral on WhatsApp, and most people believed it, and they still will believe it. But that's how important. That's how very ten. That's how very important and also very risky the media is. And no, do not get me wrong. We are not advocating for. We are not advocating for the media to be censored. No, we are totally against censorship. But we're also examining the delicacy of, of the media, especially when reporting cases of sexual and gender-based violence. So common phrases are enable rape culture, victim blaming. Oh, uh, you two, why were you going there? What were you wearing? Trivializing sexual violence. Ah, she was. It was not rape per se. Now they just, they just. She was just. She was just touched. She was just quaffed. It was nothing serious. Now you still be going. Now it's not that serious. Oh, yeah. The man raped someone. But that was before it was saved. That was 25 years ago. It trivializes it. Just because it's been years or decades doesn't make the pain any less any less severe. It's still just it's still it's still very bad. We, we should not overlook or try to trivialize cases of sexual violence and also making sexually explicit jokes. Oh, I will lash you. I will do this. I'll do that. It's just it's 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 very ridiculous. We even had a case about last year or two years ago where a governor a governor's son made a joke that 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 the test had between being misogynistic, being perpetuating rape culture, and also with tribalism was just very absurd. But that's a very that's a as someone is an influential for in making sort jokes, and it, it there was no there was no I mean people talked talked about it on Twitter, but there was no real world punishment for that. That is because we live in a society where rape culture is seen as normal. Also, societal tolerance of sexual harassment. Now we all know, unfortunately, uh, for women. If you are going to certain markets in Nigeria, especially Yaba markets, you know to expect sexual harassment. You know people will harass you. You know this. You know sellers, even passerby, to go on and and just you oh, can't this girl. It's normal. It's it's. If you are going to any market, you you have to mentally prepare that. Oh yes, you'll be touched. You be touched with that consent, and that's just that's 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 absurd. It it shouldn't be. But but that's what living in living in a country like us, where where where, where sexual and gender based violence is tolerated, is that's what that's that's what that's what. It, produces even in secondary schools most of us and at least i would when i was in secondary school you knew that oh if boys are, are littering on this corridor you cannot pass through it you have to go through you have to divert and go through another 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 way because you don't want to make we don't want them to make sexually explicit jokes or even touch you it's just those, those are the issues, unfortunately. And also inflating false rape statistics. Yes, we know some people do report um do lie about being raped. Well, that's that's it. That's a very small minority, and it's it is again. I I'm trying not to judge people's intention, but it is it is very definitely very weird that if people talk about sexual violence, they're like, oh yes, in one in one in in the year 1942, someone someone lied about being raped, or are we sure and not being raped? You know, this thing is in the minority, and you know that more often than not, at least nine over nine times out of ten times, this, this statistics is 93 percent of of rape cases are true. Over nine out of ten times, it's got to have very high probability. Nine out of ten times when someone talks, when someone reports a rape case, it's always true. So why are you not bringing the one, the less than one chance, less, uh, less than seven percent probability of a person lying and then trying to distort the conversation? It, 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 it is very, it is very, it is, again, it may not be deliberate, but it is definitely perpetuates rape culture. Also questioning the victims, oh, what were you wearing now? Uh, you said, what were you doing? Well, why did you go there? Why did you go to the office? Why did you go? Didn't you know he's a man? Men have needs. That's just, 
again, defining manhood as dominant and sexually aggressive. Yes, we know in a conservative society where men are seen, expected to be strong and all that, it, 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 may, it may seem, it may come up as harmless, but these are the issues. These are the things that people have got, oh, you lash that girl, oh, I'm with a pen shot. Words which we describe, even consensual sex, it, it just shows there's, 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 there's this underlying state of violence. It, the way we the way we talk about sex is as if something that is done to women. It's just it's just it just perpetrates violence, so to say. And also defining women as submissive and sexually passive. Again, this the express, oh yes, and she came in, she was worried, she was sitting on my bed, she did not say anything, she didn't talk. Those are the those are the underlying issues that help build a society that where rape culture is rampant. Again, the belief that men don't get raped and only weak men get raped. So there's this belief that, oh, as a man, you should be able to fight for yourself. You too, how are you raped? It's 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 absurd and it's untrue. Men can get men can be raped. Men have been raped, and it's very 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 unfair for you to disregard male victims. Again, disregarding rape accusations, teaching men to avoid getting raped. Oh, dress like this, don't go out like this, don't do that. It is just very wrong. You cannot teach women to avoid being raped. All you can do is teach rapists not to rape. As you mentioned earlier, the media is very, very important. While while it is important for the media to cover rape cases, yes, we do need we do need for we do need for sexual violence to be spoken more about. We need, we need people to see we need for people to see the prevalence. We need cases heard. We need the stories of victims and survivors told. But it is also important for us to tell it in a way the way we tell it, the way we frame it, is just as important as as it being told. Um, and when you're reporting, you should, of course, because of legal technicalities, you can't just say, oh, so, so, so person raped, so, so, so person. It's, it can, it can tether, there are some ethics of journalism where you cannot, you cannot explicitly pronounce the person as guilty before the, as, before, before the law courts sentences them or law court finds them guilty. But you can't, you should, that should not stay, that should not, because of that, you should not now say things like, oh, the man forcefully had sex with, the man had sex with a teenager, man defiles, man deflowers. Those words, they might seem innocent, they might seem harmless, oh, they, they are telling a story, but it just, it connotes, as it, says, it just connotes, connotes, it, it, it diminishes the, the, rape is something very, very dangerous, something really heavy, and we cannot just dismiss it and, by trying to use flowery words or saying, oh, someone was, you can use cases of alleged, you can use alleged if, 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 if because of legal technicalities, but not say, oh, um, yeah, I, according to, according to, or, 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 um, I mean, you should use water that not that the, the, the perpetrator was saying that, or, or the man allegedly, the man, the man, or the woman who, who the woman who is saying, the woman who is claiming that he had sex with her, those words should, should be removed from my, from my dictionary when reporting cases of rape. And, um, yeah, so one, what not to say, as I mentioned, things like, states claims and says we should completely remove disregard these words very important cases of they, they they reduce the levity of, of of rape and it just makes it seem as something passive or something that's been done again what to say rape is 100 percent perpetrator's fault like i mentioned earlier not all oh, uh the man had sex the man had sex with or the, the, the girl was it's just we should say oh the perpetrator so 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 person allegedly raped the the assault was carried out by so person not all oh, the sex the, uh, the 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 sexual intercourse or just word the deflowering those words are very wrong and we should remove them from our dictionary also um, things phrases such as she was raped or a rape occurred and the incident that happened in the girl when she was it just it's not it, i mean again it could be harmless but then for rape, you must always, always, always put the burden of you must always put the burden on the perpetrator. Not say, oh, the girl was raped. That okay? Who was the person? Who, who was the person who raped her? Who should? Who should we? Who should be the subject of the sentence? Which is the perpetrator? Always say, oh, um, perpetrator, Mister So 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 raped Mister So 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 or Mrs. So 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 or Miss So 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 raped Mister So 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 or Miss So 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 raped Miss. Miss so 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 and what I write is very it was always important to start with so 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 person did the crime not the person who the crime was done to the person who the person with some the person who is a victim of the crime leading the sentence it's just it's not a right approach to reporting cases of sexual violence and also I, I if you notice if you've noticed I've been saying things like victim or survivor not uh, it's for so some people that prefer saying survival towards victim at, at stand to end repeat, generally our own outlook at this is oh, victim is someone who's who's been 
who's been assaulted, person who's person who's been freshly assaulted. So say for instance, if you report the case to us immediately, you are, you are, you are regarded as a victim. But when once you begin your process of recovery, you then become a survivor. You survived something very insurmountable. And that's, that's just a, shine, a sign of your courage. So when reporting, you should always you should always be mindful of the terms you use to describe um, you used to describe the victim. And if you're not sure, you should always ask. You could always ask, well, how do you prefer to be referred to as? So do not just assume and say, oh, uh, the person was raped or, 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 or if it's the case where someone was, if it's in the case where someone is recounting a past experience, then it becomes very, it becomes, becomes important for you to use the word survival because you know that such a person has survived the, that survived the crime. Also, avoid minimizing any form of sexual violence. I know there's a case of, oh, if it's not rape, then it's not as serious. Oh, uh, it was the case of, the case where the man was touched, he was something, you might, again, you might not be deliberate, but from the way you frame certain things, it does, it can, it, can, it can make it seem insignificant or easily ignored by the reader. So you must always know that all forms of sexual violence are just as bad. And while it might, it, and rape is not the only case of, rape is not the only dangerous or, 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 or the most, rape should not be the only case where you should focus your importance on. Sexual harassment is just as bad. You don't, it doesn't have to necessarily involve physical contact or even the physical scars for you to then take it seriously. Also, um, also, it's very important to know that sexual assault is not sex, it is violence. It's not, oh, the man had sex without, without a consent or the man had forceful sex. There's nothing like forceful sex. The absence of consent is rape. So you cannot say, oh, uh, uh, after having forceful sex with her, after alleged, after doing, uh, after after forcing her, he forced her to have sex. He did this. No, he raped her. Rape is rape. There's nothing like forceful sex. Forceful sex is rape. There was no consent. It is rape. So we must always be mindful of that. Those little things, those little little things that we that we think are easy to ignore, those those can make or mar your your narrative. They can shape the narrative, and it can also distort. It can it can pass a message of it can pass a message of oh yes, uh, this case is not something. But it can also help lead the advocacy efforts. If you start saying things like that, if you start putting the blame on the on the perpetrator, it then it then shapes because even sometimes we're not necessarily good there with the, the notion of oh where uh, and it's not that serious. But from what we read, from the things we pick up subconsciously, we can then force, we can, it can influence our narrative. But when we say things as here, if we're shaping it as media professionals, as bloggers, as even individuals, when when reporting, when talking to our peers, it's very important for us to use the right terms because it's things like this that will then form the advocacy efforts in general and help us, help us, help us build a society where sexual and gender-based violence are not, are, are completely, are, are not the norm. Okay. Like I mentioned earlier, we tend to use gentle words because you do, oh, um, perhaps the readers are not, perhaps they are younger, we live in a conservative society, you don't really want to say, we don't really want to say sex, we don't really want to say sexual assault, you don't really want to say harassment, then we use things like fondled, caress, use feminism, we try to use gentle words because you think, oh yes, let's be careful and do it. But the thing, the fact is, the fact is, we must always come with things that hard. People know it. Even younger ones that we are supposedly protecting, they all know about these things. So it's usage of gentle words should be avoided. Again, we should always respect the survivor's autonomy by asking them for the language of their choice. Because we're because we're a conservative society, most of us may not be aware or even familiar with things like gender neutrality but there are some people that do not necessarily identify with male or female some people are binary and as a reporter even if you have your own biases it is very important for you to respect that and as was mentioned earlier things like prostitution is, you should always use words such as sex worker just try to frame it in a way that that, that is frame it in a way that is that that, that would not lead that will not steer the, con the, uh, the conversation towards rape culture um Again, avoid minimizing if you're not here to downplay sexual violence, you must tell people as it is, oh, so so person, so so women were raped. There's no need to there's no need to paint this in colorful words. Everyone here knows it. Sexual violence is not something for us to to gloss over. So um I don't know if anyone here has questions on the on language and everything we've discussed so far. All right, um, in the absence of questions, I'd like to thank everyone for joining today's webinar. We are really, really grateful for your participation and we're really thankful for you joining us, for taking our time to join us in today's 
webinar and would like to wish everyone a happy International Women's Day and also remind you that this webinar is a byproduct of our, of our reporting guidelines which was created by Witness and Witness Africa and Stand to Edit Initiative and we'll be linking, we we'll dropping a download link for the guideline in the, in the chat box. Please ensure that you download the guideline and if you're having any issues getting it, you can also reach out to us. Um, you can send an email or text or send us a DM via social media and we'll help you down, which will help you with the guideline itself directly. Thank you very much for joining us all today, and I'm really, really grateful for you providing us with your time.